welcome to the Hunger Trap podcast. I'm Lisa. I'm Diana. And this is our very first podcast. We're so excited to be here to chat to you guys about um, eating disorders, disordered eating, and just a slew of other things that tick us off or inspire us. Um, yeah, but before we begin, we want to make sure that we have a few disclaimers out of the way. Right. So we are not healthcare providers. We are not psychologists. We are just talking about our personal experiences with food and eating disorders to let others know that they are not alone in their struggles. And also, if you have an eating disorder and you're currently seeking treatment, we just want you to be aware that we're going to be speaking candidly about our own experiences with eating disorders and our feelings about food and weight and it may not be good for you. Sometimes it may find it very triggering. So just be aware of that. And take care of yourself first. So on that note, maybe we should start by introducing ourselves and telling everybody kind of why we decided to do this. We've been toying with this idea of starting a podcast. It seems like for like eight months now and just like chatting back and forth. And every time we come up with an idea, like we have to put that in a podcast. Yeah. And the reason is, uh, so we started, we, we met, we just met recently, but we've lived in the same neighborhood. We went to the same high school, but we just never spoke until like about five years ago, I would say. And then we struck up this friendship on Facebook. And shockingly, it was like one of the good things to come out of Facebook because I just like fell in love with you immediately. You're so warm and friendly and funny and the um, feelings mutual. <laughs> <laughs> but then in talking to you, my, I think I may have posted one of my articles. I'm a journalist. Um, and I have experience with volunteering for eating disorder organizations. And I have a personal experience with anorexia and I think I may have posted like an article that I wrote about anorexia and you probably, we started chatting about it. And then we learned that we have so much in common because you are also suffering from an eating disorder. And just in speaking, we were like, wow, we share the same experiences. We just treat food sometimes the same and sometimes very differently. Yes. And am I allowed to shout out your article? Because yeah, yeah you were so so Lisa wrote an article that was uh, published in the New York Times that was just so beautifully written and so inspiring and kind of, uh, yeah, I think you and I were friendly before then, but I feel like that you're post you're sharing that article on social media and me reading it um, kind of opened the door to this like, year-long discussion we've had back and forth and you know as you had mentioned before when we were talking uh it's like a daily occurrence that we talk to one another um and yeah so so you know lisa lisa struggles with anorexia for myself um i've had a bad you know not a great relationship with my body and food from my childhood um and um, you know, I, I've never been formally diagnosed with a eating disorder by somebody who's trained in treating eating disorders. But, you know, over the years, it's been suggested that I have a binge eating disorder, that it's just you have an obsession with food, you have an unhealthy relationship with food. And I've struggled with my weight um, pretty much since I was about eight years old. I was put on my first diet when I was eight years old. And... Um, that struggle, I mean, you know, we don't want to talk about specific numbers when it comes to weight, but I've been in the, uh, you know, obese, morbidly obese BMI category um, over the course of my life, um, and also just plain old garden variety overweight. <laughs> um, and, you know, one of the things when you and I started talking about our struggles, one of the things that really struck me was that the very behaviors that you partook in that were a key in diagnosing you with anorexia are similar behaviors that have been suggested to me by healthcare providers to control my obsession, addiction, whatever. I don't, I don't really like the word addiction for food, um, but uh, my obsession with food, my binge eating, and really basically to treat, quote unquote, my obesity, those behaviors have been suggested to me over and over again by healthcare providers, um, which I feel like 
contribute to that perseveration and obsession. And it, it just it really struck me that those are the same things that get you diagnosed with an eating disorder, but are suggested to me in order to make my body smaller, make me quote unquote healthier. But does that really make me healthier if you're contributing to a emotional turmoil with it? So Mm -hmm. that kind of started us talking about this whole topic. So it did. And along the way, we, I think, talk to each other more than anything about things that piss us off (laughs) that we see (laughs) happening around us because I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel like maybe we're more attuned to like the messages that people send out about food because we're so sensitive to um, to what we think it means to eat certain foods based on what people have always told us. Mm -hmm. So that kind of slides nicely into the thing that we wanted to start chatting about today, which was something that we noticed a few weeks ago. We were paying attention to the election like everybody. And why don't you tell us what we came upon that (laughs) it was so wild right so you know as lisa mentioned and in case you didn't know there was a presidential election in the united states that took place a few weeks ago (laughs) um and um it was i i believe the most polarizing um election in our lifetime possibly in our parents lifetime um and there has just been a lot of finger pointing and moralization on both sides of the fence. Uh, You know, if you're talking to a Trump supporter, they have a whole bunch of moral judgments to hurl at Biden supporters, and Biden supporters certainly do not keep quiet about what they have to say about Trump supporters. Um, And to our horrified delight, (laughs) I don't know how else to put it, we came across this quiz that was published by the New York Times, and it's entitled Quiz. Can you tell a Trump fridge from a Biden fridge? And, <laughs> you know, the the quiz participant would then click through a series of photographs of the in of the contents inside a person's refrigerator, a family's refrigerator. And then based on what they see in terms of the food that they I mean, I guess you could assume eat on a regular basis if they're you know, currently occupying their fridge. Right. Right we would make the call as to whether or not we thought those people were Trump supporters or Biden supporters. Right. And I don't think that it's any secret that the New York Times supported supports Biden. So the obvious joke that you're supposed to um, get from this quiz is that the Trump refrigerator is filled with naturally you know, going to be filled with soda and white bread, Velveeta cheese, and like what else was in that fridge? Um, milk, whole mi- milk. Whole milk. Just like the foods that you would associate with somebody who doesn't know how to eat as well as the person, the Biden fridge, whose like fridge is filled with um, like fancy water bottles and oat milk or almond milk or whatever the mm-hmm. hell the like trendy milk of the day is. And you're supposed to laugh and say, well, this person is so much more educated and classy with their fridge filled with their oat milk and this person is not. And it just struck us as so classist and gross. Like despite, no matter how you feel about either candidate, making these connections to food there's something seriously like (laughs) classist and wrong with it. You choose your foods based on what you can afford, based on what you like, based on what works for your body. So to make these associations, and it was just kind of an extension of what we've always noticed throughout our lives. These like messages that we keep getting between foods and certain um, uh, personality traits, right? Yeah. Personality traits, um, moralization of you know of of the food um i mean to me it was extremely divisive and classist and just contributing to the the division that is taking place in our country right now uh as it is and it's like well you know there's this there's this morality of food that really does kind of align to classism you know you know organic foods are way more expensive than commercially grown foods you know you have all the fear around GMO, which I'm sure we can talk about organics and GMO at another time. I'm just by training, I'm a clinical scientist, so I certainly have opinions on that. But, you know, as I'm clicking through these photos, I mean, it just, you know, it just comes across as just 
you know, a very, very judgmental and a way to poke fun um, mm -hmm. and a way to moralize food choices and align that with whether or not a person is worthy, whether or not a person loves America. I don't know. It was, yeah. But, but I mean, you know, it's funny because I feel like even, even, I'm, I mean, and I guess I could say that I, I am not a Trump supporter, uh, but one of the things that always, always upset me during everything is how his weight was constantly being criticized in the media and also his food choices. You know, he does apparently love filet of fish from McDonald's um, mm -hmm. and likes McDonald's. And there's, there's been this, um, a lot of discussion and poking fun at his body, his BMI, whether that means he's suitable to be president because he might die any moment from his horrible um, obesity and terrible eating habits. And um, there, you know, there seems to be this like quote unquote masked concern for his health, but really it was kind of a way to poke fun at him and his body um, and folk poke fun at overweight people or people who choose to eat fast food, um, which, you know, oftentimes is an economic um, decision, not necessarily a decision. And then there's some people who just like to eat it. And you know what? Why are we judging them? Let them fucking eat their goddamn Big Mac. Like exactly. And, <laughs> and so many of these um, moralizations have absolutely nothing to do with nutritional facts, right? So one of the things that really bothers me is how the $15 Java juice that you buy is somehow marketed as healthier than the grape juice in your refrigerator. And again, I have absolutely no background here to be able to tell you anything about, you know, the nutritional content of food other than what I see, what I read on a label. But correct me if I'm wrong, that they're both filled with more or less similar ingredients right oh, yeah i mean it's you know but of course you know the 15 dollars one was grown on the north side of a mountain right and watered by the tears of virgins you know <laughs> there's all these crazy things that we think are going to make a food healthier for us or you know the fact that we're choosing that 15 dollars juice over welch's grape juice um gives us a sense of morality that we're actually taking care of our bodies and it's like you know basically sugar water either way yeah. Um, you know, which if you, if you like sugar water, I'm not, I'm not judging you on that, but you know, you know, don't think you're going to live forever because you're, you're paying $15 for that bottle of juice. Right. Exactly. And so the messaging, another thing we spoke about, I think was how as Gen Xers, which we both are, we got these messages at such a young age about food that were so completely confusing. Right. So when we were little, the whole thing was you just didn't, you shouldn't eat foods with high fat content. And nobody told you that almonds were one of the best foods that you could eat. You know, nobody told you that avocados were an amazing food and I can go on and on, right? It was just like, you should choose the non-fat foods over foods with fat. Mm -hmm. So in the 1960s, sugar lobbyists paid Harvard researchers to point the finger at foods with fat so that, the, you know, the spotlight could kind of be taken off of them and any negative effects of sugary foods. And I think as a result, Gen Xers, maybe the generation a little bit before and after, just really got these ideas that these non-fat foods were better for us. Yeah, uh, like I'd love to know how this affected you because I remember vividly choosing to like stuff rice cakes and um, crumbled up snack well non fat cookies, just like stuff them into a container of very sugary vanilla non fat yogurt. And that would be my breakfast. And it would feel like eating air. You know, it's not like you felt a any satisfaction, but mentally the satisfaction was that I wasn't eating eggs because eggs were very dangerous because of fat content. Right. The, the, the incredible dangerous <laughs> yeah. egg. egg. Yes. And I got um, that message based on nothing because it's not as if my family, they were both from Italian families and like my family wasn't promoting any of that. Um, and I wasn't reading articles at age 11, which was... I, about age 12, I really started res started restricting. And about 11, I think I started to become aware of food. So I don't know where this message came from, but it must have been prevalent in advertising. Must have been. Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that was, it was ubiquitous. 
I mean, that, that, that fat was, that was the killer, you know, I mean, the yeah. truth of the matter is none of us is getting off this planet alive. Um, <laughs> we're all yeah. going to die. It's just, you know, part of being a human being. Uh, and, and we've, we've, we've approached, we've been approaching food and eating and body weight with this idea that we could, you know, completely extend our lives. And there's this, again, that, that whole, you know, the whole demonizing fat in during our childhood, I definitely, you know, you're, you're a first generation Italian. I'm second generation. My parents definitely got on that bandwagon of high carb, low fat um, eating. My grandmother, who was born in Italy, and uh, was kind of like, oh, it's nonsense. Here's some cheese. <laughs> like, what are you, like, what are you kidding me? Get out of here. Here's some cheese. Put it on your pasta. Get out of my face. My mom and dad, it was, it was a very, it was a very different approach. Um, but, you know, when you remove fat from food, uh, it becomes less palatable because fat tastes good to us. And there's a reason why fat tastes good to us. It's because we're supposed to eat it because it's satiating. Uh, so w- when you remove that and then replace it with sugar, um, you wind up um, really kind of re- reducing the satiety that a food has and you eat more of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so overall, you're eating more calories, really, or more, you know, and, and, you're, and you're not really feeling um, satiated. And, you know, the nutritional value of those foods, you know, a snack well cookie versus an egg I mean, chances are you're going to get more vitamins, nutrients, and healthy fat for your body from an egg than you would from a snack well cookie. Yeah. But now, you know, they flipped, they flipped the, uh, they flipped the coin on us and it's no longer fat. That's the enemy. It is our beloved carbs. That yes. Are, yeah. And it always fails. It always, so as a woman and let me just say right here, people with eating disorders, sufferers from eating disorders, there's no gender, there's no age. Um, anyone can suffer from an eating disorder. But I think as a woman in the society, you're very used to these goalposts moving constantly, you know, so first you have to be, first you just have to be skinny. Now you have to be skinny and look like you're 20. You know, now you have to have teeth that look like this. The goalposts are just constantly moving. And I felt like having an eating, eating disorder that the goalpost was always moving. Now it's not like you said it. Now it's not just fat you have to avoid. Now it's well, you can eat some of the right fat. Now I think like almonds, everyone's popping almonds like like pills, whatever. But you can't <laughs> have carbs. You can't have pasta, which we had like two times at least two times a week in my home which made me like sit there looking at my parents like they were dinosaurs. You know, I'm like, how do you not know? We're not eating pasta anymore. This isn't something we're doing anymore. Right. They did like, we're now the entire cuisine of our culture is being demonized. Yeah. Pasta and bread. And Uh, and anyone who's ever eaten rice or who's like, who, you know, for whom rice is like a major part of their meal. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a struggle. I mean, I, you know, I, I and, and the thing is, is we don't just hear that from our culture. We also hear that from healthcare providers. You know, I, you know, throughout the years, you know, the, you know, what are we going to do about Diana's obesity has been like the subject of every doctor I've ever seen. Because, you know, at some point you go to the doctor when you're overweight and you're like, my throat hurts. And they're like, well, if you just lost weight, I'm like, if I just lost weight, what? I wouldn't have fucking strep throat. Get out of here. Like, right. so it's, you know, I've had doctors say to me, well, you really shouldn't eat high fat and you really shouldn't eat carbs and you really shouldn't eat. And I'm like, what is left? I'm like, you're basically telling me to exist on lettuce air and smugness that maybe now I could buy a size yeah. whatever pair of <laughs> pants like who could live like that it's just it's not sustainable and conversely when I went through treatment for anorexia um, so it takes so for anybody who doesn't know when you seek help for an eating disorder you should ideally have a doctor who helps you stabilize your weight um, a mental health practitioner right like psychological counseling somebody who a psychiatrist if you require a medicine and what was the fourth thing i'm forgetting something else. oh hello nutritional counseling yeah. <laughs> and it's not 
you know, I'm not the only one who forgets it because it's barely there. Insurance companies don't really want to pay for your nutritional and nutritional counseling, but you really have to start to learn how to eat. It's, it's like relearning something that you kind of forgot how to do. And when I got specific um, eating disorder nutritional counseling, it came like maybe 15 years after I really needed it. And I finally paid for it out of pocket as an adult and I went for sessions and it was mind blowing how much of a difference it made to have this person sit there and say to me, you need to eat taco shells. And I'm like, what do you mean I need to eat taco shells? This taco shells are garbage, that's junk. And she just like looked at me and she's like, You're, we're not gonna use those words in my office. This is a food that sustains millions of people around the world. Like, who the hell are you? You should be eating the taco shell if that's what your family is eating for dinner tonight. And I know like you got completely different information on your end about how to treat your body. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, taco shells. I mean, uh, what are you doing? I've had people say to me, like, what are you doing eating taco shells? Like, what are you doing eating Doritos. Um, and, you know, just like you're going, you know, you worked with this uh, nutritionist that helped you. I read a book called, you know, because why would I go see a professional? Obviously, I should go see a professional, <laughs> but I'm on this journey um, and I'm just now starting to face my struggles and see how much my struggles mirror a struggle you know, a, a struggle like a struggle that's similar to what you have in terms of the anorexia. And it's kind of like, you know, have I been anorexic all this time and just never diagnosed with anorexia because I happen to have a larger body? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if this, if the behavior is here, if that same f f demonization and um, fear of food exists for me, you know, wouldn't you kind of think that you and I have a similar p issues, but yet, you know, the, the, um, the advice and the um, guidance I've gotten from healthcare providers has been so different than what you have. But I started, I read this book called The Fuck It Diet by Caroline Duner. I don't know if it's Caroline or Carolyn. I apologize if she ever read, listens to this and <laughs> hears that. But um, this book was so eye-opening to me because it's, it's really, I'm trying to get, get to a point where I can have a neutral relationship with different types of foods I have demonized and but then by through the demonization created the this in, an overwhelming enticement over certain foods that are like the naughty forbidden thing that I shouldn't eat so I'll deny myself it for years and then all of a sudden in secret go and just eat a whole bunch of it because god it's been a long time since I've had x y or z whatever it is um and I'm trying to neutralize those foods, I need to stop, like, I need to be able to look at Doritos and see them as, the, you know, the same, it should have the same activating effect on me as celery or a cookie or a chicken breast or a baked potato. It shouldn't be that there are certain foods that I, you know, demonize and then are drawn to. Um, I'm trying to just like turn the volume down on that. And so I've been introducing foods like taco shells and things like Doritos into my diet lately so that I could eat them and try to, you know, turn the volume down on the noise that's created around experiencing and eating those foods. So it's been very interesting. It's also so challenging because to turn down the noise because the noise is all around you. And um, when like I said before, even when you have professionals helping you overcome an eating disorder, the minute you leave the psychiatrist's office or the psychologist's office and you enter the real world or you go online, you have all of these messages. You have this New York Times quiz and you know what the New York Times quiz is trying to say to you. You know, you know what your friend's meme is trying to say to you, that meme about God is really annoying one going around now, like, um, Oh, I just saw it today, something about, well, it's about quarantine weight gain, whatever it is, right? It's like a joke about the scale. Would I rather, oh, I know what it is. Would I rather put a thermometer in my mouth or get on the scale or something like that? I don't know which one I'd rather do. And I'm like, God, you know, it's just the obsession is all around you. So you feel like you have to arm yourself so much to get away from what everybody is saying. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, there's like so much discussion over the COVID-15. Yeah. Um, And there's no denying that, you know, we are we are human beings. Right. And we seek comfort. And one of the ways that human beings seek comfort is food. And this has been an extremely trying time for all of us. Right. And so, you know, it's no surprise to me that people who are now trapped in their homes, who are moving a lot less, who have a lot more time on their hands and are also seeking for ways to increase serotonin in their brains during this very trying, scary time might eat a little bit more than they did beforehand. And yet there's this like, you know, this, this horrible judgment that comes along with it. It's like, Oh, the COVID 15, kind of like the freshman 15 when you go away to college and start Mm -hmm. drinking, drinking beer, like it's water. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's this COVID 15 fear. And then you have people who are on whatever social media, like, you know, like, oh, I actually managed to lose weight during, you know, yeah. during the quarantine. And I'm like, well, I'm, I mean, great. I can't wait until to see how that pays off for you in the next life. Like, who gives yeah. a shit? Like, yeah, it's a moralization thing. It's a moralization thing. That's what it is. It is. Like, you know, they're, they barely call diets diets anymore. I don't know if you've noticed, but I see um, there are people I know who are selling various I call them diet plans because that's what they are, but they Mm -hmm. don't, they don't call it diet anymore. They call it like, I don't know, like they have like words like lifestyle adjustment, lifestyle change, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They use the word lifestyle in there. So they're marketing it as like, this is not your grandmother's diet, you know, and at the root of it, you're just paying somebody to really teach you. I think how to balance your proteins and carbs. Like I can't really figure out maybe buy a shake here and there, I mean, they're all different. I don't want to lump them all in together, but I've just, I'm definitely noticing a lot more of that happening lately. And I wonder if it's not a backlash to this whole quarantine 15 thing. I mean, I, th- I think it is. I mean, I also think that diets and healthy eating plans or lifestyle changes or whatever you want to call it, offer people a sense of control, right? Yeah. That we are all feeling like we are so out of control right now because there is this virus out there that people, while we are understanding more and more about it every day, particularly in the beginning of this whole pandemic, it was kind of like, we don't know what the hell this is, how the hell it works, how to treat it, and why it kills some people and it doesn't kill other people. Um, and I think giving you know, people a an idea that they could control their health and they can control their well-being through a lifestyle change, um, is, you know, giving them something that they can focus on in a time where they feel like they cannot control anything. You can't control if you lose your job. You can't control if you get this virus. You can't control. So you have this, these, these eating plans that let us try to micromanage one thing in our life to give us some sense of control, even though we are wildly not in control and hurling through space on this rock we call earth. You know what you, I mean? You just described exactly why people uh, get anorexia. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly why a lot of people end up restricting their food to the point of being diagnosed as anorexia, as, as you know, as having anorexia. You want to control things that you can't control. I mean, for me, it happened at 12, just being terrified of feelings and not knowing how to deal with these feelings. I can't even pinpoint to you what those feelings were at the time. There certainly was no epidemic going on, just personal feelings. And knowing that focusing every single, uh, on what every calorie was going to be like was so peaceful. It was such a, like a sense of taking control over my body and everything is going to be all right because I'm in the driver's seat now. You know, so it's interesting yeah. to me how how society how society rewards some of these people who are you know on these diet plans as long as these diet plans don't <laughs> veer too far into some kind of like really restrictive eating situation. The lines are blurred; uh, they're often blurred. Yeah, I mean they're they're blurred, and I think a lot of the like if we were to use like a Photoshop blurring tool on the lines Mm -hmm. is really affected by what that person looks like. So if that person happens to have a body that is larger than what our society deems to be an acceptable body, blur away and just push on that obsessive crazed 
focus on every little morsel that goes into your mouth because you have to not be a fat person. Yeah. You know, I mean, and you just can't deny that. I mean, I feel like some people, I, I remember there being a quiz someplace. And of course I don't necessarily want to like bring things up on this podcast that I can't produce a, um, citation for but there was a quiz that was given to women that were like would you rather live five years less or gain 10 pounds and have to deal with those 10 pounds for the rest of your life and more people pick the shorter life wow ironically even though we're usually told that if we manage our weight we'll be able to live until we're 312 years old um so there are people out there who and i think probably more more than, than half who would rather live five years less on this planet or 10 years, whatever it was, then gain 10 pounds. I've, I say, wow, but I've seen similar, similar quizzes. Like they're similar. Um, yeah. I, there was one about like they interviewed 15 year old girls and similar question, you know, they're just, they were terrified of being fat. So I think you're absolutely right that depending on what you look like, you're given either a pass or you're told that you should really stick to this regimen of like controlling your body and beating it down and doing whatever you have to do to make it look like whatever. And again, the goalpost changes constantly there because when we were young and we were in the nineties, you just have to be really skinny. You just have to be like a twig and you know, you don't have to be healthy. Just be twiggy. Now you have to be like athletic, but skinny. It's just mm-hmm. the goal post constantly changes and we sort of like fail to see how it's all bullshit and how it just, you yeah. know, it, it's like your, your waist, you have to be able to like hula hoop with the Cheerio, but have an ass you could balance a pint glass on, <laughs> you know, and boobs that like, you know, like shoot out five feet from the front of you. And it's like, but how, like, this, who's, you know, I'm sure there are some people who are genetically blessed or just... I wouldn't even say blessed. It's just the way they look. We should, yeah. stop, we should stop, you know, you know, worshiping it. It's the way they look and that's great. But we're all now supposed to aspire to these like impossible, we, we can't just be happy with what we're, what we're with. And, and that's kind of where my eating disorder came from. It's like, you know, I, th- I feel like if I would have just been left alone, I was put on my first diet when I was eight years old, if I would have just been left alone and told to like my body as it is. I probably would have a lot less, a lot f- less to worry about in terms Mm -hmm. of either the eating disorder, the disordered relationship with food. And then also, frankly, I probably wouldn't have as much extra weight on my body because my body would have settled down and I wouldn't have been putting it through that restricting and binging cycle that kept pushing my, my weight set point up and up and up and up and up. Yeah. 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 And I should also mention, I like at my gym, the gym that I went to before this whole COVID thing happened, there was a woman who looks exactly like what you just, like, I don't know if it's natural or not, whatever it is. And she one day made a comment to me and I forgot she was selling a shirt or something. And I said like, well, that looks, I need bigger boobs for that. You know, you look, and she had big boobs and she said, nah, I don't want them anymore. They're not even in style anymore. I'm like, what? Like, so everyone is struggling in some way with some negative thought about their body. and the whole idea is like, you should be on this lifelong journey toward like sculpting that body and whipping it into some shape. What shape? We don't know. It's definitely not a shape that your body should ever be, whatever it is, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Whatever is not natural is what you should be. Not natural to you is what you should be constantly trying to be. Yes. You can't just be happy with what you have. Like you can't, I mean, and that's the thing. Like we have these messages about, what bodies are supposed to look like and all of that. But then when I look around and I see people, like I see beauty and so many different body types. And it's yep. like, I hope that those people are walking around feeling fantastic. Chances are they aren't because they are a dumpster fire. <laughs> like, it's, it's just, all, I mean, and I feel, and I know that men are certainly getting more feedback now about what they're supposed to look like, but I, I mean, from my vantage point, I feel like women, I mean, to me, all of these expectations that are put on our bodies and what we're supposed to be eating and how we're supposed to manage our health through our diet and exercise, it's like, it's the 21st century's answer to the corset. Like, we may not have yes. anything physically binding us anymore, but the expectations truss us up like turkeys. 
Definitely. I definitely feel for men. Like you said earlier, I hated all those Trump, regardless of what I feel about him as a politician, it's irrelevant. I just don't love that message. It should, the focus should never be on what you look like. It should be on what you say and what you produce and how you act. Mm -hmm. So that bothered me so much. The whole dad bod nonsense bothers me. Like I definitely think (laughs) men are not off the hook with this. I know, and I know men who struggle with eating disorders too. And I've met like more I've met more of them since kind of doing this advocacy work. So Mm -hmm. I I know that they are struggling with thinking their bodies need to look like superheroes, you know, like these Marvel characters. I'm, I don't, is it Marvel? I don't, whatever. (laughs) Like, and like, (laughs) you know, that those guys, those guys who are huge and right. They don't need to be huge. They just need to be like Christopher Reeve and Superman wasn't huge. Like they have all these expectations on them now and I feel for them. But I agree with you that this is definitely our modern day corset for sure. Yeah, it's just it's it's a challenge. And unfortunately, the expectations of our, you know, physical appearances are going to influence our relationship with food, our relationship, our relationship with two other women, yeah. our relationship to ourselves, our relationship to our health. It's just it all goes hand in hand. So, Diana, we are actually out of time, and that went by so fast. Oh, wow. Okay. (laughs) So um, we look forward to talking more about these things. We have a lot that we want to get off our plates, chest (laughs) plates. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next time. Yes, thank you for tuning in, and good luck with your journeys. 